Okay. Hi, welcome. Uh, I think we're ready to begin. Sorry for the, the technical delay. Uh, welcome. It's nice to see you, even if slightly distantly. Um, hello. Uh, I'm excited to be here. We have uh, four talks today uh, on uh, four dimensions of diversity and spatial cognition, uh, culture, context, age, and ability. Uh, and I, I won't spend too much time introducing. I'm just going to hand the floor over to our first speaker, uh, Tyler Margetis. <laughs> uh, hi, welcome. I'm Tyler Margetis, uh, UC Merced. Uh, and this is actually the representation of my talk created by Dolly on the basis of the title, not, not the worst job. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, one of the founders of cognitive science, uh, not Noam Chomsky, Immanuel Kant, um, sort of the OG nativist. Um, and he had some really strong opinions about the nature of spatial cognition. So he writes, we know what is outside us, alien so far as it stands in relation to ourselves. So he's sort of arguing for a kind of primacy of the egocentric. We find in the relationship to our body the first ground from which to derive the concept of regions in space. The vertical plane that divides the body in two outwardly similar parts supplies the ground for the distinction between right and left. So you have this argument. He doesn't cash it out in terms of cognition, but you can sort of imagine a modern day Kantian uh, supposing that our egocentric notion of space, left, right, front, back, is going to be the foundation of all further elaborations of spatial cognition. For a long time, this was assumed to be true. But in the last few decades, there's been a lot of evidence that this isn't the case. So I'm just gonna start off by quickly reviewing some evidence that this isn't the case, drawing from my own work um, out of selfishness um, and self-interest. Uh, so. Here's a project that we did down in Oaxaca, Mexico, um, in Huchitan, where folks are bilingual in Spanish and Isthmus Zapotec. Um, and we are interested in the frame of reference that they would use spontaneously to reason about small-scale space, sometimes referred to as tabletop space. Here's the task we gave them. So they watch these... Uh, these little motion events where things topple down. Uh, there's sort of various configurations, different shapes, different sizes. And then we had them move on the other side of the screen, rotate 90 degrees, and we asked them, uh, what did you see? Tell us what you saw. Uh, and this is what people said. So here's an example of a participant who saw something that was running from left to right from his perspective. So notice he's, remember, he's turned, turned 90 degrees now. Speaking in Spanish, audio is not playing. But notice this really clear rightward gesture. So he's reproducing the vector of motion, right, this axis of motion relative to his own body. He's maintained the motion uh, even though he's rotated. So he's doing it egocentrically. He seems to have encoded and is now reproducing and is reasoning about that previous motion event in an egocentric frame of reference. Here's someone else in the same community who saw the exact same motion event in the exact same direction. Okay, a very, very different motion, right? So the gesture stroke is away from the body, but sort of think about this. If the thing was moving left to right from her perspective, it was actually moving towards the screen behind her. So she's reproduced the exact right cardinal motion. Even though she's rotated her body, she hasn't maintained the orientation relative to herself. She's maintained the orientation relative to the world. So this is an allocentric, you know, other than self from a reference that she's using to keep track of that spatial, spatial motion. Um, so a quick little summary here. So they saw this thing, they had to remember it, reproduce it. And we saw that people were using two very different strategies, two very different frames of reference to encode and reproduce uh, those motion events. So spatial relations. Um, and so I'm gonna to refer to these as egocentric and allocentric. This variation is, I think really important from the perspective of cognitive science because space is also used as a foundation for other conceptual domains like time, 
and number. Um, so one really nice example coming from Lara Bordis Borditsky and Alice Gaby uh, involved uh, US Americans, but also Australian Aboriginal folks in Paparons, which is an Aboriginal town, who were asked to order a series of discs that showed a temporal progression. So here it's a picture of a man getting older. I think this is actually Lara Borditsky's uh, grandfather. Um, and uh, the question then was what spatial arrangement would people use to sort of naturally depict the flow of time using space? Um, US Americans almost invariably did it left to right. I think perhaps invariably did it left to right. But if you looked at the direction relative to north, east, south, and west, it turns out the pop ones were reliably arranging these disks going westward. So for them, time sequentially, sort of this sequential process, was going from east to west. So this is an allocentric spatial construal of time. So building on the prevalent frame of reference in that area, which is allocentric. You get something similar for number. Um, here's you know, some of my work with colleagues, Kenzie Cooperider, Rafael Nunez, similar disk arrangement task, but this time with numbered dots, ask them to arrange them. If you look how they're arranging them relative to their bodies, where each line here is showing one particular vector of arrangement, the Yupno participants in Papua New Guinea, who often rely on allocentric frame of reference for talking about space, seem to be going every which way relative to the body. So they're arranging these disks in the right order, but with no preferred direction, maybe a slight bias to the right. US Americans, no surprise, are all sort of orienting things to the right. And this sort of aligns with the prevalence of an egocentric frame of reference in Californian and most weird cultures. So this preference for an allocentric and egocentric frame of reference for space ends up being really important for how we think about other things too. So these are spatial frames of reference, right? Coordinate systems for spatial relations. Um, they supply a foundation for other conceptual domains. For small scale space, weird humans typically default to an egocentric frame of reference, left, right, front, back. But there's considerable cross-cultural variability with some groups preferring an allocentric frame of reference. Some communities even speaking languages that don't have words for left and right. So lacking sort of the standard lexical items that we might expect on a Kantian story to be available everywhere. So the kinds of questions that these observations raise for me are things like, why do we see this cross-cultural variability? And how is the cognitive organization of other conceptual domains built on that spatial frame of reference? How can we explain this patchwork pattern of cross-cultural variability? So people have done a lot of work on this. Um, and the standard approach that they've used is a comparative method, where you take two groups that differ along some really salient dimension, like for instance, the frame of reference that's preferentially used in language, and then you see whether they also differ in how they think about space. Um, so, you know, people might compare the Yupno uh, in Papua New Guinea to undergrads at UC San Diego. Um, those uh, differ in, for instance, the availability of cultural artifacts for number and also in the frame of reference that's preferentially used in language. And you might zoom in on one of those dimensions find some difference along that dimension that you really care about, and then try to correlate it with some difference in cognition and hope that that is actually uh, a causal relationship, right? Sort of correlational. This is a standard approach that people have used. The problem here is that with any kind of small scale comparison like this, there's gonna be many dimensions of difference. So we looked at the difference in the availability of material artifacts for number. I think at a glance, you can see that there are a number of other salient differences between these field sites, um, countless ones. And so this sort of raises the question about whether the particular difference in dimension of uh, variability that we really care about as the explanatory factor was really the thing that mattered and not all these other things that are also changing. With this comparative method with small scale groups, there's also sometimes a difficulty of actually having cumulative insight that builds on the observations of past people. Um, so uh, for instance, here's a picture of uh, a Chimane town. So I think we're gonna hear about this from Ben Pitt next, who's done some fantastic work with this group. Um, ben and a bunch of folks have a wonderful paper that came out uh, last year, looking at spatial construals of number, size, and time in this group, showing that they don't necessarily align. Wonderful observation. 
Um, but there were actually a number of past studies within another group studying each of these domains independently showing this misalignment. And it was just really difficult to know that that past work had already been done because they were sort of published as these one-off studies. And that's why it was actually important for Ben to go out and do the one single study to bring it all together because it's really, really difficult to get this cumulative insight when these papers are being published as individual elements. The other sort of limitation of this comparative approach is it really encourages an outside-in, unidirectional, simple causal story where you focus on language as the explanatory influence or maybe cultural artifacts or some sort of embodied practice like finger counting. And you vary just that one thing and you're like, ah, yes, it has an influence or it's correlated with cognition. An alternative to that perspective, though, is a much more ecological perspective, where we recognize that there might be causal influences going from each of these elements on to uh, spatial cognition, but they might also be influencing each other. The influences might be bidirectional. The language that people speak might reflect their preferences for thinking in particular ways, which then in turn shape the way that they gesture, which shapes the kinds of artifacts that they have. And these kinds of simple comparative methods make it really, really difficult to adopt this kind of rich multi-causal perspective and often encourage a much more unicausal approach. So this is sort of a more ecological perspective where you look at relationships between elements. Okay, so how can we advance our understanding of cross-cultural diversity in frames of reference? Well, this comparative method has been really powerful, but there are many dimensions of difference that might be inconsequential, but might not be. Um, this approach makes it really difficult to get cumulative understanding, and it encourages this unicausal account at the expense of a richer ecological perspective. So what's the alternative? I propose ATLAS, Abstract Thought and Language Across Space. So this is a large-scale data bank that I've been developing with my colleague Kevin Holmes at Reed, working with a wonderful team of undergrads that's gonna be a living data bank of existing studies of cross-cultural diversity in frame of reference. So this isn't a systematic review or a meta-analysis. The idea is that this is gonna be continuously added to and available as a resource to the community so that instead of reinventing the wheel or sort of doing these one-off analyses, we have the power of the collective to sort of shape and decide between causal accounts of cross-cultural diversity and FOR. So here's how we did it. We did a systematic search through Google Scholar for targeted search terms. Um, we included studies that involved an empirical study of spatial frame of reference or spatial reputations of number and time, um, and at least one non-English speaking sample. So trying to get beyond just studies of um, folks in California or Toronto. Um, and we first sort of did an unrestricted search and then went year by year from 1970 all the way to 2020, which is when this first version of the data bank uh, stopped being populated, although we're going to continue to populate it going forward. And then for each study and group, we coded things like the preferred frame of reference. What did people use in the reasoning? Egocentric, allocentric, or both? What frames of reference were actually available in the task? Were they forced to use one and then just tested to see how well they did, or could they choose between approaches? What were the dependent measures? What was the scale of the task? So tabletop, larger. Where were they? and what language do they speak, and we coded this in ways that allows for interoperability with other data sets. So, so far we have 347 studies uh, from almost 140 publications. This is almost a quarter of 100,000 participants um, from a variety of places around the world. Um, you can see the variety of languages that um, uh, have been studied for spatial frame of reference, but you might also notice that there are patches of the world that have been really understudied, really undersampled. So most of South America, much of Africa. Um, you have a similar story for time, although a really nice large-scale study of spatial construals of time in Brazil. And then a much sparser representation uh, of spatial frames of reference of number. Um, you know, so we could start looking at scale at what frame of reference people use for number and time. So this is looking at an egocentric frame of reference along the lateral axis, and we see this prevalence of a rightward perspective, right, where you sort of assume that time goes from left to right, but also existence of leftward cases, mixed cases, and also some people who didn't have a preference at all. Um, we can look at the use of a sagittal axis for time, where you have a 
actually lots of evidence for mixed uses, um, although also some preference for forward, but also lots of new evidence coming out that some people think of the future as behind them. And what I find especially interesting is that in a lot of cases, we have multiple domains that have been studied in the same group. Um, so uh, Dutch, English, German, Italian, Japanese, Mandarin, those are all language communities where we have evidence for how they think about space, time, and number, and then since 2020, also now that's Simone. So what's next? Uh, this data is going to be released publicly. We want to share it with the community, so this is hopefully going to be uh, in good shape by winter 2023. Um, and then when we release it, we also have a web interface so that if folks have a study that they think belongs, they could code their own data, update it, we'll sort of do a sanity check, quality check, and update it. So it's a living document that's used as a tool for us. Um, and I would love to hear from folks who are working on spatial frames of reference of what you would want to have coded about your own data to properly represent it. And the goal is that this is a collective resource for people working on cross-cultural variability and spatial frame of reference um, in a larger global ecological perspective. And this makes some really cool things possible. So new approaches to old questions. So we could ask, you know, this classic chestnut of what predicts a particular frame of reference and orientation of a domain. And we could look at scale about whether urban versus rural living actually is predictive and with enough field sites that we could sort of rule out alternative explanations in terms of, say, visibility of the skyline, for instance. But we could ask even new questions, uh, like when are space, time, and number aligned in the conceptualization? Why are they sometimes not? So this is a question that was picked up by Ben Pitt in 2021. Um, and we could sort of reflect on why there are no attested allocentric construals of number. There's no group that's ever observed that. Is that true at scale? And are there systematic contingencies between domains? So for instance, if you conceptualize space egocentrically, does that mean that as a community, you're almost never or perhaps never going to conceptualize time allocentrically, right? These questions are now possible if we have large-scale data available to us. And the idea is that we're going to have an ecological perspective on frames of reference, right? We've made fantastic progress over the last few decades on documenting cross-cultural variability. That's been great. But most of this has been done in small-scale studies that haven't been brought into conversation with each other. There's limits to that. And the hope is that Atlas, abstract thought and language across space, this public data bank, is going to leverage all the collective labor that many people have been doing in this field to understand the cognitive ecosystem of space, time, and number. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we're a little we're a little over time. So maybe we have time for one question uh, as we transition. If anybody wants to jump up to a mic, you're welcome to. Um, hi, that's uh, that's fantastic. Uh, it's it's I believe called a mapping review. Um, it's something that um, Zoe Ngo and I recently started for episodic memory development, also as an open source database, oh, and cool. I think. You know, so this is fantastic, um, really exciting. One request, I don't know if it's possible um, as a spatial cognition researcher more than a spatial language researcher, mm -hmm. is I think it's super important to know something about the physical terrain in which the group groups live. Yeah. You know, is it sloped? Is there a major body of water, et cetera? Is that at all possible? So, So one thing that... It won't exactly get at what you want, but is going to be an approximation, is uh, uh, mapping our data to existing databases that have some of that ecological environmental information. So an example is D-Place, which is a big database of cultural, environmental, uh, and sort of ecological terrain things. So that won't tell us exactly what was happening in that village, but it gives us a sense of what's happening in the area. And so that's one way that we're trying to get at that. Yeah, thanks so much, Nora. Okay, thank you, everyone. Great, okay. Uh, and just to remind people, um, we are gonna have some time at the end of all the talks for a more general discussion. So if you do have other questions for Tyler, I know there was one in the chat, um, we're not ignoring you, we're, we'll, we'll just save it for later. Um, great, okay. Uh, I'm up next, I'm Benjamin Pitt. 
Uh, and today I want to present uh, some work, uh, ongoing work in collaboration with Alex Karstensen, uh, Isabel Boney, Ted Gibson, and Steve Piantidosi. Uh, and this is work that tries to identify some of the, some of the mechanisms of cognitive diversity. In this case, diversity in people's basic cognitive frameworks for representing space, the same ones that Tyler just introduced. Uh, the goal here is to try to clarify why we see this sort of, of variation in spatial memory and in spatial language within and across groups. So, so similar, similar goals here. Um, uh, so just to review briefly, uh, if I ask, if I show you the scene and ask you to describe where the ball is, there's a lot of things you might say. You might say the ball is in front of the chair. You might say it's to the right of the chair. You might say it's north of the chair. Uh, and in some cultures, you might say it's down river of the chair. So all of these are examples of different, different spatial reference frames. Uh, and there's a lot of flavors and a lot of different classifications. I'm not going to get into the details of them. I'm going to instead focus on, on this, this primary distinction that I'm interested in, the same one that, that Tyler just alluded to, egocentric versus allocentric. So just to remind you, egocentric spatial reference frames are coordinate systems that are defined by the size of the body, like my left and right. And allocentric frames are those defined by features of the spatial environment, like uphill or north. Um, okay, so so different language groups vary dramatically, as we as we just saw, in the kind of spatial language they they use, and they've been they've been studied and classified accordingly. Um, uh, but they also differ in the spatial reference frame they use when reasoning about space, uh, even when no language is required. So Tyler just showed us. Uh, a very cool example of a non-linguistic test of spatial reference frame using gesture. Uh, another uh, another way to test this, and, there, and there's many, uh, but one that's relevant that's going to be relevant here is is what I'll call the reconstruction task. And the way this this task typically works is the participant faces a study table and studies some novel set of objects, like three animal figures in a row. Uh, practices reconstructing that array, rotates 180 degrees to a test table and then is asked to reconstruct the array. And the, the trick here is that there's two right answers, uh, one that corresponds to an egocentric frame and the other that corresponds to an allocentric frame. Uh, and, and what's been shown um, uh, beautiful, in lots of beautiful work in, in lots, of, uh, on lots of distinct cultures uh, is uh, clear, what, what appears to be clear preferences for one spatial reference frame or another and real differences across groups. So some groups appear to be predominantly egocentric and others appear to be predominantly allocentric in the way they solve these nonverbal spatial tasks. So the question I want to ask uh, has been asked many times before, which is why, right? Why do we see this sorts of variation? Um, some researchers on the basis of, of the cross-correlational evidence that, that we've, we've um, seen have suggested that the, the differences in spatial memory are actually caused by differences in, in spatial language use. Uh, that's a very interesting possibility and sort of an ongoing debate, but it's not the question I want to focus on today. The question that I want to ask uh, is, why do either of these things vary, right? Why do people talk or think differently about space within and across cultures? So the answer I want to I want to suggest here it has to do with differences uh, in visual spatial perception and memory. So specifically, uh, I'm going to talk about what's called mirror invariance. Uh, this is a phenomenon that's been that's been studied in, in visual cognition for a long time, which can basically be glossed as spatial confusion on the lateral axis. So this is sort of most obvious to many of us, probably observing children trying to learn to read and write. Uh, and one thing that becomes very clear is that. Disting distinguishing letters like B and D is incredibly hard and is like years in the making uh, uh, and is actually particular or, or, or most strong on the lateral axis. Uh, so B and D is harder than say B and P. Um, this is something that's not just a feature of, of kids learning to read and write, um, but is actually observed across, across species. So in, in uh, octopuses and in monkeys, uh, and in other, other species as well, you find the same, the same mirror invariance. Basically, the, the images on the right, which are lateral reflections, are much harder to learn to distinguish than the images on the left, which are equally different physically, but uh, easier to distinguish psychologically. Uh, and you find the same uh, mirror invariance in some adult groups, especially in low literacy populations where people are asked to distinguish mirror images, either in two-dimensional or three-dimensional shapes, and they 
insist that they're the same even when viewing them simultaneously. So the, the lesson from that, that literature, um, I, I would summarize as the lateral axis is weird, right? People vary dramatically in their ability to make left-right distinct discriminations. Um, and yet, despite the sort of peculiarity of this axis, the, the lateral axis, most studies of frame of reference use depend on it. Either they study it only or they sort of re rely on it primarily uh, to classify groups and to study how they, how they think and speak about, about um, space. So I want to suggest that actually these differences in, in frame of reference that, we, or that we're seeing across cultures and perhaps within cultures may be driven at least in part by uh, the differences in people's perceptions of left-right space. So this is a proposal that builds on, on previous work by Peggy Lee and Linda Barbanel and our own Tyler Margettis and Stephen Levinson before them, among others. Um, here, what I want to do is propose uh, and test a, a, a sort of general form of this proposal, which I'm calling the, the spatial discrimination hypothesis, uh, which says simply when reasoning or speaking about spatial relations, people tend to use the relevant spatial continuum that they can better discriminate. Whether that continuum is defined by the sides of their body or by the features of their spatial environment. So if that's true, then people who are unaccustomed to making left-right discriminations should sometimes abandon that axis, that egocentric axis, in favor of other more reliable allocentric things like where the river is or where the hill, the slope of the hill. Um, that is, we should expect uh, any allocentric preferences to be strongest. Uh, on the lateral axis. And this is actually a prediction that, that already has some support in, in the literature. On the strongest prediction of this account though, people, people's frame of reference preferences might actually reverse across axes where people uh, prefer allocentric space on the lateral axis, but prefer egocentric space on the sagittal axis, the front back axis. Um, alternatively, of course, people may have no choice but to fixate predominantly on just one frame of reference, as, as has been suggested uh, in the literature. And so to test this, it's hard to test this in American adults who tend to be overwhelmingly egocentric, even on the lateral axis. Um, but a, a better test bed can be found in, in the Chimane, a group of farmer foragers indigenous to, to the Bolivian Amazon who I've had the pleasure of, of working with. Um, there's a lot that's interesting about Chamani culture, but, but one thing that's relevant here is that they have relatively few of the, the artifacts and practices that emphasize left-right spatial distinctions in the experience of, say, U.S. Americans or, or Canadians, experiences like reading or writing or driving cars or using sinks. So, uh, and instead, Chamani people are known to navigate large parts of the Amazon uh, on foot, uh, starting when they're when they're children and they cover large large areas and when we ask them to point up river or east they they're impressively good at it even when when in an enclosed space so these features of chamane culture suggest that they may have good allocentric spatial abilities uh, and the question we want to ask here is uh, whether they use allocentric spatial reference frames generally or whether they use them selectively for making distinctions on uh, on the lateral axis so to test this, we compared, uh, first, we compared a uh, frame of reference use across axes uh, using the reconstruction task. So this is the same task I talked about earlier. You memorize an array of objects, rotate 180 degrees and reconstruct it uh, uh, like this. Uh, but importantly, we had them do this not just on the lateral axis, but, but also on the sagittal axis. Uh, same participants. And then we had, we also had those participants do um, what is an even simpler test of the spa of spatial reference frames, uh, which is, which we call the selection task. Uh, the way this works is we lay out five identical cups, uh, one set on each table. Participants are asked to touch a target cup on the target table, uh, sorry, on the study table. They turn around 180 degrees and touch, are asked to touch the corresponding cup um at, at the at the test table and of course the 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 idea here is to is that one one response corresponds to an egocentric frame and the other to an allocentric frame okay so that that was those are non-linguistic uh tests of frame of reference let's see what they did so we'll start with the lateral axis this is in the reconstruction task and what you can see is there's a, a preference here for allocentric spatial frames of reference this is this is common among uh, among unindustrialized groups 
Um, but if we look at the sagittal axis, we see this, this clear reversal where the same participants in the same room using the same materials are, uh, prefer using egocentric space um, to solve this, this same task when it's on the sagittal axis. And we find the same reversal in the selection task. So what's going on in both of these tasks uh, is that people, these Chimani adults, are using non, uh, different non-linguistic frames of reference on different axes. Cool. So here's sort of a schematic of, of that result, allocentric on, on one axis and egocentric on the other. So that's uh, consistent with one of the predictions of, of our spatial discrimination hypothesis. Um, but then the question is, what about spatial language, right? We just, I just showed you tasks that don't involve any, any language at all. Um, now we want to ask, do people talk differently about spatial relations uh, on different axes, the way that they think differently about them on different axes? Um, or alternatively, perhaps people simply align with the dominant coding system in their speech community, right? You could imagine uh, that for the purposes of communication, it might be beneficial to converge on a single system. Okay. So in experiment two, we tested uh, a new group of Chimane adults uh, in their spatial language uh, on the same two axes. Uh, we did this using uh, the director matcher task. So the way that, that this task works, it's designed to elicit spatial language. We give the director, who in this case is the man uh, on the left, uh, a, uh, a simple spatial array. In this case, it's a toy chicken and pig. Uh, and he's asked to describe it to the matcher, the woman on the right, whose job it is, is to try to reconstruct an identical array. Uh, and of course, the, the, the trick here, I guess, is, is that uh, they can't see each other. You can sort of see that there's an opaque barrier that separates them. They can't see each other or each other's gestures or the figures. And the idea is that that encourages the director to encode all of the relevant spatial information into his speech. Um, and they did, they, they said a lot and they said things like the pig is on my side and the chicken is more over there facing east, put the, big, the pig to the west and the chicken to the east facing me, so on and so forth. Uh, we had 18 directors and we went through and coded all of their, their spatial language as either egocentric or allocentric. Okay, so here's what we found. Let's start with the lateral axis again. We see the same preference on the lateral axis for allocentric space. And on the, on the sagittal axis, we see uh, the this same, this same reversal, where on the sagittal axis, they're talking, uh, they're speaking about space using egocentric frames. So here, the, the summary is that, that just like in the, in the nonverbal condition, the nonverbal tasks, these Chimani participants are using different frames of reference on different axes, in this case, in their spatial language. So, okay, what does this tell us? Um, Oh, I'm running out of time. Uh, I'll just summarize briefly. Um, I think the first thing this tells us uh, is that uh, it makes it pretty clear that people do not fixate predominantly on just one spatial frame of reference, right? That actually, instead, FOR use varies within an individual uh, across these spatial axes. And so whenever we're testing only one of these axes, like the lateral axis, um, we're going to get only sort of a one-dimensional picture of, of that person's FOR use. Uh, and second, it, it shows that spatial memory patterns with spatial language, not only across cultures, but within the same language group. Um, to be clear, this is, this is neat, I think, but it doesn't actually clarify whether there's a causal relationship between them and what that causal relationship might be. Um, and finally, the thing that I, I find sort of most, most motivating about uh, these, these initial findings is that they suggest that spatial discriminability could potentially explain variation at other, at other levels as well. So not just variation across axes, but across cultures, between individuals, uh, and over development. And we have some, some ongoing work now to, to start to look at variation in the relationship between spatial discriminability and FOR use at these other levels as well. Uh, and by sort of, by doing so, by studying conceptual diversity at, at all of these levels, uh, and I'll quote Lee and Gleitman here, the quest is for a unified explanation of when and why individuals or populations, be they speakers of one language or another, pre-linguistic humans or members of other species, solve spatial problems in varying ways. Um, okay, that, uh, I just wanna thank uh, the Chimane, first of all, and our translators, um, my funders and, and um, institutions that have, have supported me and, and of course, my collaborators and, and advisors. Uh, thanks very much.
Okay, do we have, let's see, what time do we have? I think we have three minutes for questions. Anyone have a question real quick? Hey, yeah, I've got one. Um, and that's about sort of <clears throat> the distinction between the egocentric and allocentric and what that conceptually is. I noticed that one of the sort of um, two two different kinds of reference that were both called allocentric there in the coding scheme were referring to sort of different entities. There was both East and West, but there was also references to parts of the table. And um, that sort of makes me think, you know, if you're on a ship, you might refer to port and starboard, or you might refer to north and south, um, depending on whether you're talking about where you are in the ship or where the ship is in the world. Um, and I was wondering if, um, oh, now I've actually forgotten the question about that. <laughs> Um, but I was wondering if these are, oh, right. I was wondering if you noticed any particular patterns between a sort of absolute global scale frame of allocentric reference and other sort of meso level allocentric frames of reference and whether you notice any patterns in the qualitative data. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. And, and there's certainly a lot of ways, there's a lot of flavors and sub flavors of, of allocentric in particular. Um, we haven't really dug into it deeply. You might have noticed that in the language data, I sort of, although my columns showed egocentric and allocentric, we do we do break it down some. Um, there's there's more analyses that need to be done there. Our for the nonverbal data, we don't at least these tasks don't allow us to distinguish between things like like are you using the sides of the table or are you using you know the the flow of the river um but you can imagine other other tasks that that are able to make that distinction and, and i think that's a, a worthwhile endeavor yeah cool thank you um i'm gonna pass the floor on now Okay, let me get this ready. Great, okay. You're using your laptop? Okay, next we have Holly Huey, who's here to talk to us about diversity in uh, spatial cognition across age groups. Okay. Yes, you are. Do you want this? Um, Alrighty. Hi, everyone. My name is Holly Huey. I'm a PhD student at UCSD. I think I am having some slides issues. One second. <clears throat> Let's try one more time. All right, let's switch. Sorry for the tech issues. Play instead of rehearse. Right. Cool. All right. So it's like you're saying for, um, my name is Holly. I'm from uh, the University of California, San Diego, but I'm excited to present work that I've done previously at NYU with Dr. Moira Dillon, along with Matthew Jordan and Yuval Hart. Um, our lab at NYU, the lab for the developing mind, is really interested in exploring spatial cognition through the uh, lens of geometry. Um, across generations and across time, humans have developed really rich uh, formal systems of geometry. So formal geometry underlines mu much of human achievement from science and technology to art and architecture and builds upon foundational but very abstract concepts. <clears throat> so for example, concepts like a point being infinitely small or a line as being infinitely long. But despite the abstractness of these concepts, humans appear to intuitively grasp these foundational definitions of geometry, perhaps in part based on how we physically interact with these spaces and objects within our environments. So, for example, when traversing from point A to point B, a straight line is the shortest, most efficient path to take. And 
So a major thrust of this work is uncovering the contexts that shape our natural geometric intuitions. And moreover, what their developmental origins are that eventually lead to such sophisticated uh, formal geometry systems. And so to investigate these, these really broad questions, um, a really big aim of this study that I'll be presenting is to benchmark what those intuitions are in the first place and whether they hold across different contexts. Um, now, previous studies exploring humans' intuitive natural geometry has frequently converged on the conclusion that regardless of formal schooling, humans are spontaneously attuned to foundational principles of planar Euclidean geometry, principles related to concepts such as lines, parallelism, perpendicularity, and uh, symmetry. And prominent theoretical perspectives suggest that there are two separate systems, uh, cognitive systems for geometry that have emerged through human evolution. So one system prioritizes distance and direction information to support navigation and is often investigated by asking children <clears throat> to navigate spaces of varying enclosures. So for example, on the left, uh, studies show that four-year-olds uh, could reorient in rooms that were enclosed by short or tall walls but fail to reorient in spaces that were merely defined by lines on the ground or by pillars at the corners of the spaces. Additionally, on the right, other work has shown that children more easily orient in spaces with more extreme dimensions, such as the rooms that are on the left versus on the right that are converging towards more square features. And a second system is theorized to prioritize length and angle information in order to support uh, visual form recognition. And this is often probed by asking participants to make judgments about shapes of varying lengths and angles and to identify other shapes that deviate in such information relative to others. So these are um, uh, object deviation tasks. So for example, all these shapes are um, here that I'm highlighting are different from their corresponding array. However, a, a key aspect to note is that this literature has frequently used stimuli within planar Euclidean contexts. And so without investigating humans' intuitions about non-planar contexts, these conclusions that we have so far fall short at the moment in comprehensively describing what composes our intuitive geometry. Limited, um, but in really important cross-cultural research, really inspired by the prior work that we've seen, has begun to probe both humans' planar and non-planar intuitions, um, but, in, but in limited ways. So intriguingly, this work also suggests that humans' intuitive geometry reflects planar Euclidean principles. So for example, in this one study, adults from the Murunduruku tribe of the Amazon were asked questions about shapes of both planar and spherical surfaces. Um, here, they were trying to identify the location of the apex of what would be the completed triangle, as well as what its uh, magnitude of the angle would be. And while this work in particular offers really rich insights on the nature of human intuitions about non-planar contexts, uh, it was limited to relatively few questions presented in the spherical context and, and not really any specific questions about uh, principles of geometry, just broad questions about shapes. And so building on this particular study, what we wanted to do was to more specifically investigate children and uh, adult intuitions about principles of geometry in, in spherical or non-planar contexts. Um, while non-planar contexts that we navigate in real life look something more like this, so the surface that I'm displaying now, we decided to probe children and adults' intuitions about a more simple surface, uh, such as a sphere. Uh, in our study, we evaluated 48 six uh, to eight-year-olds uh, children and 48 uh, adults' judgments uh, from the U.S. about a single foundational concept, uh, that being their judgments about linearity. So. On a plane, straight lines are the shortest distance between two points. However, on the surface of a sphere, lines can look curved or straight, but importantly, lines that appear straight are not always the shortest distance uh, between two points. And so what we wanted to see was whether or not these uh, children and adults were sensitive to how lines and distances interact with these non-planar surfaces. Uh, to investigate uh, our participants' intuition about this ambiguity of spheres, we presented them with a series of 2D images of 3D spheres. In one kind of image, we presented them with geodesics. A geodesic is the shortest path between two points, illustrated here as the solid black line between the little purple and orange dots. 
And if this path were continued around the whole sphere, it would be defined as a great circle with the largest diameter and it would cut the sphere in half. In another kind of image, we presented paths and spheres that would not be the shortest paths uh, between these points. Um, they're called arcs. So in this case, if a path were continued around the whole sphere, it would not be the circle with the greatest diameter and would therefore not cut the sphere in half. And additionally, uh, to, we wanted to vary whether these paths were um, uh, geodesics or arcs. We could also vary whether or not these paths looked like straight or curved lines by rotating the angle of these spheres. So, for example, if this top sphere were rotated upwards, the geodesic could instead look like a curved path. Similarly, if the uh, bottom sphere were rotated downwards, the arc could instead look like this curved path here. <clears throat> and although I've used examples of uh, spheres with decreased opacity, uh, participants were shown opaque spheres and only the discrete paths between the two points. Um, one more thing is that we actually adapted uh, that we actually adapted about our stimuli is that the arcs uh, looked like curved lines that were matched in distance between the points um, of their corresponding geodesic uh, curves and were made to near, be near opposites of their corresponding uh, geodesic lines um, in their apparent curvature. And I can talk a little bit more about that in a bit. <clears throat> so for each test trial, participants saw a pair of spheres. This was a 2FC. And we're told that the purple point in each image was a very lazy snail uh, who they were told always took the easiest, most efficient path to a orange mushroom represented as an orange dot on the images. Participants were told, here are two paths. Which path is the easiest path that the snail can take to get to the mushroom? And participants pointed to which path was the easiest one on the screen. And this uh, script was used the exact same between children and adults. Um, to note, this work builds upon the prior research using navigation paradigms. And here's an example of two kinds of trials that we presented participants with. So critically, there were, there were the two kinds of paired spheres. So in each trial, participants could either see a pair of spheres comparing arcs that were rotated to appear as straight lines um, and geodesics that appeared as curved lines or arcs that appeared as curved lines and the same corresponding geodesic curved line. Um, same meaning here, uh, a geodesic of the same length shown at a different orientation though. Now, in both of these kinds of paired spheres, the geodesic curve would be the most efficient path between these two points, and so would be the correct answer here. And we generated our stimuli such that these spheres were presented at random um, uh, varied orientations at whole degree values, avoiding perfect horizontals or verticals, um, although these rotations were matched across pairs in each trial. And additionally, the apparent but not the absolute distance uh, between the points were matched between and across pairs. And we vary these distances between points uh, at five possible distances and six different heights. Uh, before getting to the results, something I want to highlight is that uh, we actually wanted children to avoid selecting a geodesic that looked like a straight line, uh, simply because it'd be in the middle of the sphere. And we thought that children might attribute a uni uh, unique status to them, a special status. And so we wanted to um, avoid that. And so this meant that we actually only included geodesics that looked like curved lines. So. Uh, getting to the results, looking to our right, our paired conditions are along the x-axis, so I'll walk through shortly. And because our paradigm was a comparison between uh, two options, uh, chance performance was at 50%. So when presented with both a geodesic and arc that looked like curves, 68-year-olds were surprisingly accurate at choosing the geodesic path. <clears throat> um, here, geodesic curve responses were shown in blue here. Um, and while we had no strong predictions about how children would perform in this condition, we, we were nonetheless surprised by how well they did given the subtle difference between the paths and that we merely flipped them across their x-axis. And this suggests that children were sensitive to how paths interact with spherical surfaces, despite the obvious fact that 68 year olds don't have experience with formal spherical geometry. However, when these children were presented with a geodesic curve, that would be the correct response, and an arc that would appear as a straight line. Children showed a robust bias for selecting the straight, but in this case, incorrect line as the most efficient path between two points. In, in other words, children could flexibly choose between the correct geodesic curve when there was no competing straight lines, but nonetheless demonstrated a planar bias when given the option to choose a straight line. <clears throat> 
By comparison, adults succeeded at selecting the correct geodesic curve, uh, regardless of the kinds of pairings that they had of spheres. But something that is intriguing to note is that while participants, uh, adult participants of performance was overall higher than children's, their pattern of results is actually quite similar to children's. So here I'm referring to how the blue, bar blue bars here are actually higher when geodesics are compared to curved arcs, but performance actually drops for both children and adults when geodesics are compared to arcs that look like straight lines. And so what's so intriguing is that we still see a planar bias in adults. Um, in fact, there actually isn't a significant interaction between these two age groups. And we were quite surprised to see this kind of consistency across ages. I, I don't have a plot for this, unfortunately, but I do want to mention that we conducted some exploratory analyses on age effects between these six to eight year olds. And what we found was that the older children performed better than younger children on curved art conditions, um, indicating that children get better at understanding how curved lines uh, interact with spherical uh, surfaces. But even the youngest children were still performing above chance in this condition, suggesting that even the youngest kids and six-year-olds had surprisingly accurate judgments at picking out efficient curved paths on spherical surfaces. Um, however, we didn't find any significant age effects when children were given the option of an incorrect arc that looked like a straight line. Um, and this indicates a pretty consistent planar bias across younger and older children. So in conclusion, we begin with the question of the extent to which uh, humans are spontaneously attuned to foundational principles of planar Euclidean geometry. And while our work doesn't adjudicate whether this claim is correct or incorrect, our work provides a broader perspective to how children and adults' planar biases uh, extend and, and find that both age groups are able to make surprisingly accurate judgments about paths on spherical surfaces, depending on whether or not they're being compared to curved lines or straight lines. And this suggests that our explicit reasoning about simple geometric figures is not comprehensively explained alone by Euclidean principles, um, especially given the fact that even adults are rarely taught um, in their formal education principles of spherical geometry. Um, again, suggesting that such geometric intuitions are likely grounded in our everyday activities, perhaps in our navigation of various surfaces. Now, a critical aspect of our design is to note that uh, we couched uh, participants' judgments in the context of navigation, and that may have, in fact, enhanced their performance. So, in particular, questions about spherical linearity were posed in the context of uh, an agent's navigation and efficient action. Uh, prior research has shown that even infants have strong intuitions about the fact that intentional agents take efficient actions. And so it's possible that this paradigm was particularly well suited for drawing upon the flexible intuitions that children might have about non-planar geometry. Um, however, we also saw a remarkable consistency in both children and adults' planar biases um, in their consistent selection of straight lines as being the most efficient paths between points on spheres. And perhaps this could be the case um, because we use 2D pictures instead of 3D objects or even animations. Um, we, we showed participants 2D pictures of 3D surfaces um, because they might see them as such in formal geometry textbooks. But using 2D pictures uh, might have made their intuitions about 3D geometry harder to access, especially given the fact that any intuitions about straight arcs, um, which appear straight, only appear from one viewpoint of the sphere. And instead, it's possible we might want to show animations such as this, in which an actor's movement um, along paths unfolds across time. And this might better facilitate participants' uh, performance. So here I've shown an example of what an inefficient arc might look like. And here's another example of a possible geodesic curve that would be an efficient path for this agent. <clears throat> And lastly, there are a number of other geometric principles that might have hindered participants' performance. Um, for example, while we matched the distance between points on spheres, this actually meant that the apparent paths of the geodesic curves were in fact longer than the arcs as they appeared as lines. And these perceptual features uh, may have in fact impacted our participants' judgments about efficient paths. And so future work might um, fiddle around with these properties of our stimuli, but also we would love to explore other ways in which um, other properties besides linearity are playing in people's um, intuitions about geometry. So in summary, our work demonstrates that both children and adults succeed in their judgments of spherical linearity, However, children demonstrated a planar bias to judge the most efficient path to be straight lines, which is largely consistent with prior work, but surprisingly remained consistent even among adults. 
But lastly, given their successes with making judgments about lines and spheres, children may develop a natural geometry that is not merely limited to the uh, Euclidean plane, but that draws upon intuitions gained from our everyday activities, for example, in judgments about agents efficient navigation. Uh, importantly, this benchmarking of US children and adults' performance sets the groundwork for other uh, further developmental work probing the origins of our geometric intuitions. And whether our early reasoning about simple geometric uh, figures also shows flexible but planar biases. And of course, uh, as well as further calls for cross-cultural examinations of how different environmental contexts and education may shape our intuitions about different geometric properties of the objects and spaces that we interact with. So with that, I'd like to thank all of you for lending me your time and attention. And many, many thanks to my collaborators and co-authors, uh, Matthew Jordan, Yuval Hart, and Moira Dillon. Thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering if there was any sort of secondary effect of which orientation the sphere was in, given that our ordinary navigate navigation is in a context with hills and gravity and not in a context. Well, I guess there are bowls, but there's still gravity. That's very interesting. Um, I don't know off the top of my head if we saw orientation effects. Um, we did ask children uh, just to describe what they were thinking about as they were making these judgments. I don't remember anyone saying that gravity was had an effect on the snails' uh, navigation across the spheres. Um, some some work in our manuscript that I would encourage you to look at. There was an effect of curvature um, in terms of uh, whether or not children showed more or less uh, planar biases with like a, a less curved arc. Um, and I think you'd be interested in looking at that. But thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, great talk. Um, I wanted to follow up on what you were talking about, how much the finding that you get might be dependent upon the fact that you use two-dimensional representations rather than the 3D forms. And when I play that out in my head, I feel like people, the, even the kids would do much better on a 3D globe mm -hmm. than they would do on the two-dimensional drawing. And if you agree with that, then I want you to comment on how much that has to do then with the kids not overall understanding of the, the 3D form and the geometric relations, but on the that translation process to this specific two-dimensional drawing? Hmm. It's a very interesting question. Um, just as an anecdote, I actually had a very difficult time coming up with animations myself of how to convey what a geodesic was using 2D images. When I've done this presentation um, in person with uh, poster presentations, I actually bring along a little ping pong ball. So it's a 3D object. And I show people by orienting um, the ping pong ball with different arcs and stuff. So I, I very much agree that using 2D pictures um, is very difficult in that mapping. Um, there is something very interesting that we couch their judgments in navigation. So in, as we navigate our various surfaces, we can't um, pick up the globe and move it around. Um, it is very possible, though, that children and adults are actually drawing upon their intuitions about how they interact with little objects, so some uh, manipulable objects. And we have no strong predictions about whether or not it's navigation or manipulation of small objects. But you're right, it is very much easier to... Um, manipulate and orient and see how the rotation affects um, people's judgments about what is the inefficient path. Um, an example I've liked to use in the past is that a lot of us flew here to Toronto, and when you looked at your um, uh, display on the airport, uh, you might have seen a trajectory of your plane going across uh, the globe, and they always generally look uh, curved, but if you play around the screen toggle, it's kind of fun to pick out the one viewpoint in which you can make the path look straight. So I also agree that being able to manipulate animations would be a very um, intriguing direction to explore. So thank you. Thank you. Works. Thanks. Uh, okay, let's see. I'm going to start, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with one from online, just because I've done a bad job of attending to them. Um, there was a question earlier for Tyler, I believe, um, that says, great idea. Uh, question, and this is from Barbara Lando. Um, question, uh, how will you define, categorize the differences between so-called language versus non-linguistic tasks? What qualifies as purely non-linguistic? Uh, 
uh, first, thanks for the words of encouragement. Much appreciated. Um, so we're actually not that invested in uh, drawing a hard line between linguistic and non-linguistic. Um, in, in part, that's sort of the general approach to this project is to be rather agnostic so we just get all the data together and that if you have a particular theoretical orientation that leads you to treat, say, a particular memory task as non-linguistic, then run with that. Um, but we want the data to be useful for folks of all stripes. Um, and so we actually do have some studies that involve um, spoken responses. So people, so it's, we did include studies that were purely linguistic elicitations that were just trying to document the preferred frame of reference used in language, but we did include studies where people were reasoning or remembering and responding through speech. Um, is that considered, would we want to consider that non-linguistic because it's sort of just an expression of the underlying reasoning? I wouldn't say so, um, but the idea is to sort of build up this data bank in a way that isn't making strong commitments either way. Yes, um, thank you all for the very interesting talks. We've only gotten very recently into the topic of spatial navigation and representation. And um, I've been wondering whether the, um, the differences that you've all described in your various researches can be um, understood from a more normative perspective, like what, what is the organism trying to achieve? and uh, how does the representation chosen follow from these goals? Sure, I'll, I'll, I, I can answer after. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, no, I think that's a, that's, a, that's a great way of framing it. And, you know, looking cross-culturally and cross-linguistically at differences in spatial frame of reference, you, you do see, so like one argument, for instance, that you get a reliance on these allocentric frames of reference in cases where you don't have literacy, you don't have practices that impose an asymmetry along this lateral axis, but you do have really salient landmarks that are available that then become really useful tools. So there's a, there's a river that runs through. So in those communities, you often get like uphill, downhill reckoning, um, or there's uh, a mountain. Um, and uh, that makes sense totally from this perspective of people just trying to communicate and reason in reliable ways that don't break down during the communicative encounter and also sort of just work for themselves as individual cognitive agents. So I think that's, that's a great perspective, totally. Yeah, and that's sort of in the background for a lot of the way that I think about it. Yeah, I can speak a little bit from the navigation standpoint. Um, I think first and foremost, by couching this in navigation and also efficient agents, that is that is the underlying goal, is that we're trying to take the most efficient paths across uh, services. Um, I think there's also something to be said that we were uh, providing paths to our participants. And I've also dabbled around a little bit of game design and have wondered what it would be like if participants were able to navigate themselves across these spheres or planes, et cetera. And my intuition or just my gut sense is that people would be overestimating the amount of curvature. And a study like that would provide us a more fine-grained understanding of the trajectories that people choose and also how they overcorrect later on down the fact. But I think a study like that down the line would be particularly um, useful as we do a lot of remote navigation of autonomous vehicles across different services and such. Yes, thanks. One, one thing I wondered about was um, how far do you want to have to travel for this to become relevant, like re relative to the curvature of the sphere? Sorry, can you actually repeat what you said in the, how relevant this is like, or to what extent? Yeah, like like this distinction between the arc and the, geod and the geodesic. I mean, this, this doesn't become relevant when you're only trying to go from here to the bathroom, but this is important when you try to tra travel substantial distances around the globe. Can you comment on this? Uh, for sure. So yes, I, I also think this is very relevant to flight paths that we've had to take. Um, you have objective um, targets um, on our own Earth, but of course that'd be, this would be highly relevant for space navigation to other planets, for instance, where you would need to make a prediction about what the most efficient trajectory would be with, again, remote navigation. Um, 
I also think there's something to be said about um, these were third party agents. There could also be differences if you were to be navigating a car yourself. And uh, from your own perspective, what might look curved or straight? Thanks for the question. I'm going to take, I'm going to alternate now and take a, another question uh, from the interwebs. Uh, Neil Cohen um, asks, uh, has a question for Tyler. Interesting talk, Tyler, and cool project. Are your analyses also focusing on how good tasks are at capturing the intended spatial construles? For example, the card sorting task you mentioned at the start, um, those are confounded by the fact that visual sequence comprehension requires a fluency that is modulated by exposure and practice to visual narratives. See, for example, my book, Who Understands Comics, and my poster tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'll definitely go to the poster, Neil. Um, and I love your book. Um, yeah, so again, I don't want, I don't think Kevin and I want to be making judgments about task quality. We really just want to be documenting what tasks people have used. Um, but it's a really interesting question whether certain dependent measures or certain tasks produce more reliable results. Uh, whether you get really, really clear demarcation between allocentric versus egocentric preferring communities with, say, a non-card sorting task. And then do you see sort of like a, a, a messy morass of confounding with card sorting? So that's, that's the type of result that could fall out from the data bank um, and would be the type of thing that, you know, Neil himself could totally do with the data set. Uh, but we're not going in and doing... Um, actual coding of task quality yeah on purpose hi great talks i have a question for benjamin i guess but for everyone maybe so i was wondering whether you have any implicit tasks in your uh, Tsimane population because the feeling i have from your research works but maybe it's my take is that you often use and in the literature it's often the case explicit tasks such as for example order the elements in a series but i don't know and that's my take if it's entirely fair to use this task to challenge mental representation such as the number line for example that has been traditionally proved to exist through implicit tasks when we when we prove that the mental number line exists and people from different languages different cultures different ages organize things from left to right we never ask them organize the elements we we ask them to, to perform parity judgments, magnitude comparison, very implicit tasks. And the, the, the people that believe in the mental number line never says that this is something to do with the explicit way we organize the world. So I would think that your point will be much greater if you provide like snark-like effect tasks for the Tsimani, whereas only providing like explicit tasks, I'm not entirely sure it, it really destroys the mental number line hypothesis, and I'm not saying you say that, but I know that a lot of people taking your work use this as an argument to say the mental number line, well, it's all bullshit. It doesn't exist, but uh, it, it, the tasks are different, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Well, to be clear, I, I would never argue that the mental number line is bullshit. I think it's very real. Um, uh, I, I take i agree with you that there are some important differences between implicit and explicit tasks if i if i had thought that it was sort of practical to do a smart like task with the chamane then i very well might try that i haven't figured out a way that they're very unfamiliar with computers and we have evidence to suggest that that even very simple tasks that you give them on on a computer interface um the results are different when when because of the interface um, setting that aside, the sort of practicalities aside, um, I, I, my, my, I guess, line of thinking on this is that uh, uh, implicit tasks are great for showing that these are sort of, that things like the mental number line are automatic. Um, they, but I think it's true that if you asked people who show strong left to right snark effects, right? If you ask those same people to organize numbers, I mean, this has been done. If you ask them to organize numbers or organize events in time, as Tyler was talking about, if you make it an explicit task, then you find the same result, right? Um, I'm not sure that the inverse is true, right? I'm, so, I, so point taken that it could be that people have 
different, some kind of different implicit mapping that ex than explicit mapping. But I guess my thinking is, if um, if you have if you have uh, if you have this if you have some kind of mapping from that has a particular direction, then you should at least find it in explicit tasks, right? That if you're like, no, no, I want you to think, I want you to really stop and think about where you're putting these on the basis of number, as opposed to like parity, right? Or as a, or like color or some, some of these sort of magnitude indifference tasks, um, then you, then you should find it, right? The fact that we don't in, in, in the work I think you're talking about, that you don't find strong directional biases, uh, in my work or Tyler's work, um, in these in these more explicit tasks, I think is actually maybe it is as good is, is good evidence that those those mappings don't that those mappings wouldn't also be found by implicit tasks. I'm, maybe maybe you have maybe you think differently about that, and I'm curious to hear. No, no, that. I think I agree. But uh, one reason more to like overcome the practical it is pro practical problems of testing implicit tasks. I, I, I've been testing people in Namibia, for example, and it doesn't take much. Uh, to learn like an iPad if the task is relatively easy. So maybe the Atlas framework would help, but yeah, I think yeah. it's, it's a great point, but let's test it. Like let's test implicit tasks in this population sure. so that we, sure. we can make the, the I, I would expect, I would expect very similar results, but it's, it's an empirical question. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's, let's switch maybe to the, to the back. I'm not sure who was first, but I'm just going to alternate. Oh, sure. So, um, Ben, my question is for you also. It's a really nice talk and project. And I guess my, my question is like the lateral sagittal difference. It's such a whopping difference. Like it's a yeah. big, you know, experiential difference in ease of access. Absolutely. And the differences you're finding in description are like 60, 40, maybe 70, 30. And I guess I'm curious if you have intuitions about why there's still so much variability in descriptions that people are using when there's this very big difference in ease of access. It's a good question. I mean, I guess my intuition is, you know, I think one of the lessons of, uh, one of the takeaways from the data is that people have at any moment seem to have access to egocentric and allocentric frames both sort of in memory and in language and so um i i don't i don't find it personally i don't find it that surprising that we find uh, a mix um there are it's it's uh you know there there we know even from i mean i i guess i would i would sort of i sort of have the same question about why there are differences individual differences even in cultures where it's overwhelmingly egocentric where right like among Canadians, for example, right? Like sometimes in these tasks, people are, actually do give allocentric response, responses. And I think that's an interesting empirical question. I mean, one intuition I have about that is, uh, I mean, the answer that sort of the spatial, that, that my hypothesis would offer is like, there are real individual differences in people's ability to discriminate left, right space, right? And so that could account for, for, for some of that variability. My sister, for example, is a 35 year old who struggles terribly with left, left and right. She's highly educated. So I was wondering, yeah, are the, are, if I can follow up, are the differences that you're finding from averaging across people stronger within person? Like, do you get strong within person preferences or at least within a moment within a person? Whether there's consistency within people. Yeah. Yeah. I have, I didn't show that. Um, my memory, my memory of this is that is that we find the, the we find the same reversal in the majority of people, but um, so it's not just that that some people are are you know speaking one way and others are speaking the other way, um, but I don't have I don't have a, a, a I don't remember offhand exactly how 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 strong the consistency is. It's a good question. Yeah. Rob, please. Great. Yeah. So unfortunately, this question is also mostly directed towards you, although I think there's tie-ins to what Tyler and, and Holly were talking about at least too. But um, so your argument, as I see it, is that the egocentric frame is more salient than the allocentric frame for for the sagittal task. And that makes perfect sense because just intuitively you feel like, oh yeah, whether this is close to me or far from me is a super salient uh, dimension. But I guess 
I'm worried a little bit about circularity until you tell me like what is the determinants of salience and and I guess that's potentially a tie-in to Tyler's uh, project to to try to figure out what are these dimensions of salience and and I guess more generally I'm a little bit worried or I would just like be interested in your um, uh, thoughts on whether salience is just a single thing or whether it's also going to depend upon task and priming, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the part of your question, I think is about sort of what determines how, I mean, I, I try to avoid the word salience and, and use the word dis discriminability instead. And I, I, uh, it's a, it's a fair question. Like what, what does discriminate, like what does discriminability mean? The way that I and others have operationalized it is basically the ability to sort of reliably distinguish the position or orientation of objects on a particular axis, which, right. So like the, like distinguishing these from D's, um, uh, that, that it's a, it's an interesting question sort of what causes differences in that I'm, I'm not sure if this is what you're asking but uh i think there are people who have who have posited various hypotheses i don't think we really know the answer but it seems that reading and writing experience is a great way to figure out how to distinguish things like these and d's but it, it extends beyond letters um but it's not the only thing that can do that. There's evidence that other sorts of um, lateralized practices like weaving can can seem at least correlate with the ability to to do this sort of left right d discrimination. Um, I don't think uh, I don't I'm not sure I see the the, the circularity that you're pointing to. The the, the claim is that um, those that basically that these sort of differences in cultural experience. Uh, like reading and writing and maybe weaving and other things um, sort of allow some people uh, to overcome this default mirror invariance that animals have and that on the left, right, the right, which applies to the left, right axis. And, uh, uh, and that as a consequence, that axis becomes more reliable for encoding spatial information that if you can't keep track of whether it's a B or a D, or whether it's on this side or that side of you, then it's just not a useful continuum to use for spatial memory or spatial language, uh, or spatial language. Can I, I want to yeah, pass it to Yeah, Tyler. so I think that, yeah, I think Tyler is going to continue this, just because a circularity involves fleshing out exactly the dependencies across cultures in terms of like literacy and, and the salience, I think, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, literacy is definitely um, in the short-term plans for Atlas, uh, along with weaving. That's great. I, I hadn't thought about that or read that. And I, I think that information is in, is existing cross-cultural databases like DPlace, and so we'll be able to pull that in. So that's great. Um, but uh, I was wondering if you thought of actually using either a natural experiment or a real experiment to manipulate discriminability along that lateral axis. So uh, putting a glove on someone on one hand, or finding people who have some unusual morphology, either due to disability, uh, congenitally, or accident, where I, I imagine that your prediction then is that that would increase discriminability and would lead them to sort of preferentially encode things egocentric along that axis. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're you're describing exactly our our plans, um, which is yeah, that's exactly the idea, and and. So yeah, so I agree if that that from that the correlation, no matter how strong the correlational data is between, you know, people's spatial discriminant, people's mirror invariance and their their use of spatial reference frames, it's we can't make strong causal claims from from that at all. What what would be required is something like what Tyler is describing, which is okay, let's let's try to manipulate mirror invariance, which I think is should be possible in the short term. Uh, and see, you know, if that has an effect and what effect that has at all. Um, I'm realizing that we are over time. I'm happy to stay and people are welcome to stay, but no one will be offended if people need to go to lunch or, or whatever. But I think you need to go to lunch. <laughs> Tata needs to go to lunch. Okay, so then in that case, why don't we...
uh, unless yeah why don't we break and and those that can hang out will just hang out over here and i'm happy to to keep discussing thanks so much for coming everyone. Yeah. <laughs>